All right, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh. Thank you. Okay. Good morning and welcome. I'm Ashley Van Ruckel, and I am a member of the Seidman College of Business Alumni Board here at Grand Valley State University. And it is great to see such a wonderful crowd here this morning for the first Secchia Breakfast Series of the academic year. And I hope you've had the opportunity to connect with those around you, and if not, we encourage you to do so after the event has concluded. And I would first like to take a moment to welcome a special guest in the audience, Grand Valley State University President Tom Haas. Thanks so much for being here this morning. And I would also like to thank Ambassador Sekia and his wife Joan for their continued support of this breakfast series. The students, alums, community, and college greatly appreciate all that you do to continue to make these events possible. And uh, for those of you that would like to continue to learn more about Ambassador Sekia, he will actually be the next featured speaker at the Seidman Alumni Social on October 26th. So mark your calendars, and we would love to see you at Grand Rapids Brewing Company. And on behalf of the Seidman College of Business, I would, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Birgit Close uh, back to the stage today, and she is gonna share a little bit about why West Michigan works. So Birgit has been the CEO and president of Right Place for almost 30 years. And Right Place is the uh, regional nonprofit economic development organization focused on promoting economic growth and has been a part of creating a vibrant West Michigan economy over the last 30 years. And Birgit has experienced firsthand West Michigan's path to growth and is here to, uh, today to share with us why this region is unique and where it might go tomorrow. She was recently on the list of the 100 most influential women in Michigan and was also awarded the Peter C. Cook Excellence in Business Award from Davenport University. And also in breaking news, last evening she was also awarded the National Economic Development Leadership Award from the International Economic Development Council. So it is my pleasure to welcome up to the stage, Birgit Close. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for that kind introduction. I didn't realize somebody picked up that I was in Cleveland last night to uh, receive that award. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> uh, I also would like to say that I, I guess I, it'll be, I'll be celebrating 29 years with The Right Place on no November 30th, and I was 18 when I started, just so everybody understands that, right? <clears throat> the organization celebrated its 30th anniversary last year, and of course it was started by uh, one of our wonderful business leaders, um, Jay Van Andel. And so I'm, I'm very proud to, um, to continue to lead the organization. I want to um, uh, thank President Haas, or T. Haas, as everybody refers to him, uh, this morning for, for having me. And um, your leadership in the community under Grand Valley continues to just outperform everybody. Um, you turn out fabulous talent, much of, uh, quite a few of them work for us. And uh, I also want to thank you for your leadership on the Right Place Board. It's been very appreciated. And Peter and Joan Sekia, um, no introduction is needed. Community leaders, business leaders, tenacious supporters of this community. And, and Peter and I just talked over breakfast. He's off into robotics now. So uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be working on something new together, right? Um, so I really wanna, wanna thank you for, for your passion, for, your, for the community. It's made a huge difference, and that's what I really want to talk to you about. So I usually talk about the topic this morning to audiences from out of town. Um, you know, how, what makes this community really work and unique? I, I was, I, as it was said, um, I, I was with 1,100 economic developers from around the country and, in fact, the world at a conference of the International Economic Development Council in Cleveland yesterday. And... Um, uh, and every community from St. Louis to Bentonville, Arkansas, to Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, talks about their workforce, uh, their sunsets, their quality of life. It's a great place to 
live, work, and play. We all say that. I can tell you if a picture from the Ozark uh, Lakes doesn't look any different than a sunset over Lake Michigan if you just see the brochure. So what I want to talk to you about this morning, what really does make this community work? Um, and after 29 years of working in this community and 33 years of living here, uh, um, some of us on my team have been asked this question many times, and I get to explain it to uh, people from out of the country usually. Uh, Japanese groups, I'm speaking to one from Amway in a couple of weeks, groups from China, groups from Germany, and they kind of scratch their head. And one of our German clients said last week, where's the catch? And really then they have to say there really is no catch. So what I really want to talk to you about is, is what makes this community really work. And I think it's the people in this room, but I'll get into that. Many of you know, um, if you know me a little bit, that I'm a great gardener. I, I turned an acre of land into a beautiful garden over the last 18 years. And I enjoy it because I love to see things grow. I love to plant them. I love to see how they develop. Um, I love to plant a tree. And that all reminded me of a statement that was made um, by Warren Buffett in about 1991. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone else planted a tree a long time ago. <coughs> Think about it. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And we have planted a lot of trees with the help of many of you in this room over the last 35 or 40 years. When I moved to Grand Rapids, and this is not, not negative, but this was a pretty average community. We had good companies. The Emory Grand had been built. But after 5 o'clock, we kind of rolled up the sidewalks, right? And people referred to it lovingly as Bland Rapids. Nobody does that anymore. And so what has happened in those intervening many years? What have we really done? We have built things like the Amway, the JW Marriott, the Michigan Me State Medical School. Um, Van Andel Institute is 20 years old this year. They're celebrating the announcement of the Van Andel Institute at their October event this year. When Dave Van Andel called me in July of 1996, and he said, Birgit, I want to let you know that we are, my dad and I have decided, my family and I have decided we're going to endow an institute for medical research. I'm like, yes, a new industry is about to be born. And what has happened on the Hill, it's just exploded. Talk about building, talk about planting trees. The Van Andel Arena. Um, Dick DeVos and I were smiling at each other when we were passing each other during the Paul McCartney concert. Because I can tell you, 25 years ago, nobody ever thought we would get Paul McCartney into Grand Rapids. I'm still working on the Rolling Stones. <laughs> but I'm on Can Still Hope, right? Art Prize. We're in the middle of Art Prize, nine, six days into it. Largest art event in the world. And a lot of my colleagues from around the country um, in Cleveland yesterday know about Art Prize. It has gone everywhere. And people try to emulate it. But some things can't be emulated. They tried it in Dallas, and it didn't work so well. And of course, we talked over breakfast, Peter and I, about the medical school. When the Van Andel Institute came along and Spectrum Health started to grow, we had a two-legged stool. And behind the scenes and quietly for many years, he tried to convince a few people we needed a medical school. And today, we not only have a medical school, but they're going through their second iteration already. And of course, Grand Valley is on the hill. Medical Mile is completely different. When you used to drive up and down Michigan Street, it looked pretty dark. But now it's you know, the heart and guts of, of uh, a real diversification strategy. So all of those trees look a little different. My staff and I started talking about, we get asked this question all the time, well, what makes you unique? We entertain people from Springfield, Illinois to Springfield, Missouri. And we finally decided that what does make, what is it about this town? We came up with really four ideas or four, four pillars, if you will, that we believe make this community unique. And that's entrepreneurship, philanthropy, collaboration, and the vision what this should all look like. So let's start with, with entrepreneurs. We have one sitting at the table. I mean, Peter Sekia is the epitome of entrepreneurship in this community. You took a small company, $12 million, I remember you said, or something like that when you took it over. And it's a multi-billion dollar business today with over 10,000 employees. There are many of these. Uh, you have Meyer. Uh, Brett Meyer started the first supermarket in the late 40s. You have Amway, Universal Forest Products. You have 
Many companies like Wolverine Worldwide, they're over 100 years old, Steelcase over 100 years old, Hayworth, Herman Miller, Bissell, uh, statue was dedicated to Anna Bissell here not too long ago. Those are the big ones, Spartan Nash, Gerber, they all started very small, and yet they still are pillars of this community. And then there's a whole bunch of them in the middle, Lax, Autocam, ADAG Automotive, Notions. If you think about the wealth of companies we have and the strength of those companies, it really is remarkable. And obviously we have the privilege with working with all of them. So those are entrepreneurs that not only have they created companies, but once they are successful, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's <coughs> allergy time. <coughs> they, <coughs> they invested in their companies, they invest in their employees, and they invest in their community. So that's, I think, the result of all of that is what you see today. <coughs> and when you look around, the big difference about this community is we are not a one industry town. Think about it. Dow Chemical right now is merging with another Dow company and they're laying off 700 people. Midland is completely dependent on Dow and has for decades. And then that merged company will merge with DuPont. We don't know what will happen. But we have such a plethora and breadth of companies in sizes of over 2,000 and 60% of them are still family owned, 60%. A professor at Grand Valley some years ago did an analysis of that. It's the highest percentage on a per capita basis in the United States. It's really what gives us this strength, this local, multi-generational, family owned companies that make things. And it's still important that we make things from auto parts, to furniture, to medical devices, to doing research that will end up in, in potentially pharmaceutical. That's really, our, that's really our strength. But we also need to continue to feed the pipeline, if you will, of new companies to come along. Because like trees, some trees die and you need to really fill that. So you have the found founders. I mean, we all laugh because it's my staff's second office. Um, uh, you know, Rick Chapler has his own mug over there. But um, all kidding aside, that small craft brewery is now the 15th largest brewer in the country. I mean, it's pretty amazing. OST, we have a growing IT industry here. Five, six years ago, the right place to have their re website redone, we had to go to Denver. This time we went around the block to a little company called Mighty in the Midwest. And 11 people did a fantastic job right around on Monroe. So we want to also support buying local, right? There's a company in Ada making diapers. Anybody heard of Smart Bottoms? Great small company started by a woman making cloth diapers, you know, and is now shipping them all over. And that's, you know, and then you have Start Garden. You know, Rick DeVos is carrying on the entrepreneurial ventures of his family with Art Price, which, you know, nine, eight years ago, nobody knew what it was going to be, including Rick. <laughs> it turns into this, you know, community happening. But then he followed it up with, with Start Garden to really fill the pipeline of entrepreneurs and start new and help start new businesses. In other words, new trees. So, um, and you, all of you, are keeping those companies here, you're keeping them growing, and you're keeping your wealth here. A lot of communities, and Jackson, I'll, I'll pick on Jackson, not because I want to pick on Jackson, but it used to be the screw machine capital of the United States. All of the companies in Jackson, Michigan, were sold to non-local companies. Now, had the owners, the former owners, reinvested that money into Jackson, Jackson would look different today, but they didn't. But here, we keep reinvesting. And that is a really big difference. And that brings me to philanthropy. You know, you can't give it away if you didn't make it. So, um, and a lot of people in this community have been very successful. But they didn't keep that success to themselves. They share it in their time and their treasure. You're sitting in one of the buildings that was built on, on that treasure, right? I mean, uh, I remember Bill Seidman um, and sitting with him over dinner with the leader of or his colleague from BDO. 
and, and telling this German fellow from Hamburg how philanthropy works in the United States. It did not quite compute. Because um, it, it, and it's not a negative, it's just doesn't, it, it's different. It's culturally different. So the, the vitality of this region over the last 30, 50 years is really due to the reinvestment of those successful entrepreneurs into so many anchor projects, if you will. Whether it's, yeah, I, st I worked for Don Lovers uh, over 30 years ago. There was no Eberhardt Center. Actually, during my tenure with the university, we built the Eberhardt Center. It was the first foray into downtown. And look at what's happened to the downtown campus. I mean, it's one of those anchors. Um, Millennium Park is one of those anchors. Spectrum Health, Van Andel Institute, this university. You, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and we keep coming together to really, really reinvest our, our money into this community. And you don't have to. Nobody says to anybody that you have to do this. It is purely voluntary. And that's what makes, I think, this unique. Um, I, I think most of you know that um, we located a company from Las Vegas here recently called Switch. Um, a very, very big deal, one of our largest deals. Uh, wasn't so easy to do, but we did it. Um, the company, of course, took over the, uh, bought the pyramid, or leases the pyramid, has completely been redone. They've employed over 400 people in construction out there already. And they started operations um, recently. They're going to continue to grow out there. But they figured out immediately how this community works. And they are a very, very philanthropic company in Las Vegas. And they already become a major, major participant in Art Price. If you go to the Art Price hub over um, uh, on Sheldon, they, ha they have a STEAM uh, program there, S STEM with an, e with a, with an A, i.e. for art and have become totally enmeshed in, in Art Prize and are going to get more involved in the community as time goes on. So they caught our culture immediately and became investors, if you will, and philanthropists in West Michigan. Now, I will admit that you know, philanthropy is not the only thing um, that, that we're good at because you can have entrepreneurs and you can have money, but it could be deployed in various places and that's where collaboration comes in. Uh, we, we identify an issue in this community, and then we get a group of us together, could be different every time, and we say, what does it take to make it happen? This is a very, very unusual thing. Not a, in fact, my colleagues around this, the table last night in Cleveland were talking about collaboration and how do you really, it's easy to talk about but it's not so easy to do. Because you're having to bring different people with different opinions around the table and get them to agree on, this is what we need. I, I remember being part of the discussions around the, the market. Do we, re somebody came up with the idea we ought to have an indoor market. And then somebody said, do we really need an indoor market? What do we know about indoor markets? Well, let's go look at other indoor markets and what they do and what, how they work and then the Grand Action folks called a group of us together, and today we have an indoor market. We take all these things for granted sometimes, but don't, because they are not that easy to do. But it is really what makes us terrific. Um, as I said, I get to talk about this about every year, about, about private-public partnerships, because that's really how we work. Uh, you can't just build an arena without also talking to the city of Grand Rapids and getting them involved. So I try to explain this to a number of Chinese delegations, German delegations, Japanese delegations, or even just a German client last week who, as I said, said to me, where's the catch? And how do you explain there isn't a catch? This is just how we work. But in their cultures, private-public partnerships, philanthropy, um, giving back to the community, starting an organization like Right Place that's not government-driven is not in their DNA. It's just not how they function. They pay taxes and that's how it gets taken care of. And so it's very difficult to explain that a group of business leaders, community leaders, would invest in the right place or invest in a building or pay for a children's or invest $100 million of philanthropy in a children's hospital. That would never happen. The government would build it. 
And so it's, it's, I always get strange looks. We hosted the governor of Shiga, Shiga Prefecture about a month ago, and he wanted to learn about the right place in the community. He had never been here. He is the equivalent of Governor Snyder, and with a translator, we tried to really explain how we work. I'm not sure we ever got quite through to him, but he was intrigued, I have to say. Um, and uh, um, the blank stares really are, are always, and you try to explain it different ways, but they're like, and the, at the end of a German, of, we had a group of German parliamentarians in, and I'm explaining this in German, and finally, the leader of the parliamentarian group said in German, but you still report with the Bürgermeister, right? <laughs> Which is, of course, the mayor. And I said, no, not really. And he's like, he walks away shaking his head. So it's very difficult to explain a very different kind of collaborative, philanthropic, entrepreneurial culture. So, so the, you know, you see the collaboration in an organization like Right Place and Grand Action. I mean, 35 years ago, Jay Van Andel convened a group of 14 of his colleagues from Dick Gillette to others and Fred Meyer and said, oh, we need better economic development. Uh, and, you know, the result was the first private-public partnership for economic development in Michigan. We're still around. We're still funded the same way we were then, 80% private, 20% public and, and foundations. Grand action, same thing. It started off as Grand Vision in 1990 because a group of leaders wanted to have a vibrant downtown. Where do we start? So we have an arena today that's also 20 years old. I keep referring to it as our new arena. Well, it'll be October the 8th, I believe, when it's eight, 20 years old, which is very hard to believe because it's become such a part of our, of our scene, right? And who would have, like I said, who would have thought we would enter, have Paul McCartney there? Um, and then, obviously, the market, et cetera. So we are just, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed what has happened in the last 30 years. But the collaboration today goes beyond building buildings like this one, which is fabulous, but it also goes to regional collaboration. Because today, in a global environment, we are not just competing um, Grand Rapids to a small community in, in, in Germany or a small town in Arkansas or whatever. You have to be globally competitive. And so about six years ago, Governor Snyder decided he was going to divvy up the state into 10 regions. And we are region four. And that's 14 counties from Allegan to Mason. 1.5 million people. And he said, so now you all go figure out how to play together. <laughs> and, um, and we are collaborating together. I see heads nodding because today we tell our story of our success regionally on a global basis. And that's the only way we can compete. We have to collaborate around economic development, workforce development, infrastructure development, education, and tell that story to the world because somebody sitting in Stuttgart knows about where Michigan is, maybe. But if we continue to think that we can say, well, here's Holland and here's Grand Rapids and here's Ludington, we are not going to succeed. And if a job lands in Holland, it's as good as a job that lands in Greenville or in, in, in Grand Rapids. That's what regional collaboration is all about. We have regional issues. Think about it, 196 doesn't stop at, at a county line, neither does a water and sewer line, and companies don't really care. Uh, uh, President Haas helped us host five site consultants last week in, in Grand Rapids. Site consultants are very important people who help make companies decisions of where they're going to locate a new plant. So you have to treat them, that they're, they are rather an interesting group because they know they have a lot of power, and so we entertain them here, we bring them here, we, sh we bring them here during Art Prize, obviously for obvious reasons, but we showed them Medical Mile, we had them talk to board members, community leaders, we showed them all over. And then we did a community roundtable last Friday morning and we asked them questions. And one of the things they said with great clarity, companies do not look at municipal or political boundaries. They don't know the difference between Wyoming and Granville and Grand Rapids and Greenville. To them, this is all West Michigan. Make it easy for me, remove the barriers, and wherever the jobs land is where they land, and they're good for all of us. So regional collaboration is another hallmark of this area, and it's working. It's working very, very well. And that's how we can compete um, uh, to, in, in today's world. My, my colleagues, 
from around the country are almost all leading regional economic development organizations. The Indy Partnership is 13 counties. Northeast Indiana is 12 counties. So we really do need together and present ourselves globally to, to the whole, to the world. And if you think about it, we have the major airport and we're going through a $45 million uh, expansion. And I see Professor Isley lighting his head. He did a great study for the airport on, and its um, economic impact a couple of years ago. But here's another interesting thing with the airport. We needed that expansion. The airport had $25 million to do it. We needed 45. So the regional airlines, now chaired by um, Bill Payne from Amway, said, well, let's raise the other 20 million locally. We're 90% there. And so what you, uh, nobody in the country has ever done that for an airport. Nobody. And so when people say we're raising money to expand our airport, people are like, really? And we're having calls from all over the country asking about how do you do this with an airport, right? So by the same token, we also need to think about the Muskegon Harbor. It's the largest deep water harbor on the west side of the state. It's extremely important to logistics. Another thing pointed out to us last week, it's about talent, logistics, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's, that harbor is losing its major customer, consumers energy, when they close the car plant. So we are collaborating with our friends in Muskegon County to figure out how are we going to fill that harbor again with more um, goods that get transported in and out of here. Because if we don't, the Corps of Engineers won't dredge it. So from airport to harbor, we're all one region. So when I leave for Germany on Friday and talk to about 15 new companies, I represent our entire region and all of its resources and, and, pe and people. That's what we do today. And it goes beyond, so we have got collaboration when we do philanthropy. We have collaboration in the region, uh, including obviously higher education. And we have collaboration um, amongst our companies. In 1989, a group of five manufacturers challenged me and said, so what are you going to do for me if I don't build a new building? And I'm like, okay, that's an interesting question. Usually economic developers are about bricks and mortar, right? Building, machinery, equipment. We'll get you some incentives. We're all ready to go. They said, well, what if we don't need that? I said, well, what do you want? He said, well, I would like to meet that guy over there or that woman down the street. I don't know them, but I sure think we can work together. That was the birth of the Manufacturers Council. 27 years later, they're still together, sharing best practices, teaching, learning from each other, setting the standard for manufacturing in West Michigan. Kind of an unheard of thing. People sitting around the room and talking to each other about how can we be better together. It's what Bill Seidman's dad noticed about the region during World War II. I'll never forget Bill Seidman telling the story that when, when the federal government was looking for companies to supply war material, and all the big companies stood up, but a bunch of small companies in Grand Rapids said, listen, we're only small, but we are gonna form a consortium and we can do this. And Bill's dad was so impressed with this. And that tradition is really continuing with the Manufacturers Council. Today we have councils in Ionia County, in Owego County, Montcalm County, and a bunch of other counties around here. But it's that kind of collaboration, B2B, that uh, people don't understand either. It's like, really? Why would they do that? Well, because I think stronger is better together. And I think that's really what makes this region unique again. So, and the regional airlines. Uh, when we went after 10 years, it's 10 years that we had the first visit with Southwest Airlines. It would be 10 years on October 4th. And we, we needed an, a low cost airline because we were the second most expensive airport in the country. We could not compete. We were losing people to Midway, to Detroit, and to Flint Bishop. And so we set about, as a, as a business community with the airport, to figure out how do we get better air service so that people can actually afford to fly out of GR forward. And when we got to a certain point, we figured we really needed business leadership. And we found a guy called Dick DeVos who loves to fly. And even though he doesn't need the airport, um, st stepped up anyway and uh, formed the West Michigan Regional Airlines. And by golly, we got AirTran. And after AirTran was sold to Southwest to help us keep them here. 
I mean, I'm condensing a many year story, but it's another regional collaboration, philanthropy, whatever you want to call it, but without that effort, we would not have that airline. And in fact, if you talk to any Southwest leader, and one of them spoke, I think it was last year, at the Economic Club, they will tell you that that model of a business community coming together to convince an airline to stay here or come here is unique. That in fact, they are telling other communities who want to keep Southwest or get Southwest, go look at Grand Rapids and how they did that. They were so impressed that we would pull together business leadership around the issue of getting better air service. And we're continuing that today. The Air Alliance has transitioned to the right place. Bill Payne is his chair. And it's the Air Alliance, along with the Gateway Transformation Campaign, that is raising that extra $20 million we need. So again, another collaborative, philanthropic, innovative, typical West Michigan, let's solve the problem kind of a thing. So the final component I want to talk about then is a common vision. I remember moving to this community, uh, as I said, 33 years ago, and we had the Amway Grant downtown already, and the 1913 room, which was nice, and a few other nice, nice um, restaurants. And after that, it wasn't kind of, it was great, but it was kind of, you know, boring. Um, and, um, and I remember being invited to a few meetings on how do we make downtown really a downtown again. And uh, it started off as Grand Vision, and became grand action. And, and there were hundreds of people involved in this process. I remember the first meeting at the old pen club. There were 200 in the room. So it wasn't some clandestine idea or a small group of people huddling. It was really talking to the community about what do we want to be again. And communities, in my opinion, are like products. They have life cycles. There's innovation, there's growth, there's maturity, and then there's death unless you catch it up here and you reinvent yourself. And so this community back 30 some years ago started to say, let's reinvent ourselves. And what does that reinvention look like? And that's where this vision came in. How can we make this community vibrant again so that we attract business, we attract talent, we keep business and we keep talent. And that's what you see <coughs> and that's what you really see today. And so we decided on a bunch of anchors, the Grand Valley Downtown Campus, I've mentioned them before, Van Andel, the, what's happening, um, Van Andel Arena, a new convention center, uh, new hotels. I mean, any time of the week, night of the week, you go out in Grand Rapids now, somebody said to me the other day, you do a great job, Birgit, but the traffic is getting bad. <laughs> I think you still can get around town in about 20 minutes. It might take you 25, but it's still not very bad. In fact, um, a uh, client who came from a very big city said, it's really easy to get around here. I said, that's, that's right. But some people are saying, it's really getting kind of busy. But um, we, we love it that way, right? I mean, we should, because you can either have one or the other, but you can't have both. So um, those large projects have spurred many, many, many other smaller investments. And all of a sudden you have apartment buildings popping up like mushrooms all over the place. People want to live downtown again. People want to go downtown for their entertainment. Um, it's the, as I mentioned this German company a couple times. They were in a week ago today and they drove over from Chicago. Uh, first time here, they parked a um, few blocks from our office and they walked around before they came to the meeting. And the first thing they said is, this, is not, this does not look like a typical American city. This looks like a vibrant city where you've taken your older buildings and revitalized them, interspersed with brand new buildings. How did you do this? this? We did not expect this. And that's what we usually hear when we bring a company that is not local into town. We did not expect this. And that's why, regardless of where that company locates eventually, we always start them off downtown. Because that is really our calling card today. So, um, I believe that is what makes West Michigan work. Entrepreneurship, philanthropy, um, collaboration, and a common vision. But I also said, what's next? Because who are the next tree planters? I see a lot of you in the room. I'm so thrilled to see so many young people in this room. 
because you're it. Uh, there are companies that are going through transitions right now. The community is going through leadership transitions right now. Um, some companies are being passed on to the next generation, and we want that from the second to the third, in some cases the fourth generation. It's critical that that happens. It's critical that we continue to hand off what many of us in this room have started 30 years ago to the next generation. Who do we pass the shovel on to, and are you ready to receive it? That, to me, is our next challenge. Because 10, 15 years from now, we still need entrepreneurs, philanthropists, collaboration, and a vision. And because if we sit on our, we can't. We cannot be satisfied with what we have. If we stand still, somebody else is not, and it's going to pass us by. So how do we collectively, generationally, pass on that, that idea that if you are here, and this is another thing that I think is unique, philanthropy and collaboration is not sort of something we ask you to do. It's an expectation. I think it's a good expectation. If you can't give up your treasure, give up your time. But get involved. It, you can't sit on the sidelines. You just can't sit on the sidelines. So my question to this room full of many young people is, what tree are you going to plant for the next 20 or 30 years? Thank you. I'd be delighted. It's a shy crowd, wow. Yes. Well, you know, that's the question. I think where, where we are in the life cycle of the community, we have right now, as I said earlier, a very, very large number of our companies are family owned. And it, it's an incredible strength for us at Right Place to walk into a business and talk to the owner about his or her plans for the future is critical. But not every business owner has follow-on leadership. So is the company going to be sold to another local owner or to somebody out of Hannibal, Missouri? And I'm not picking that out of the air because it happened. Because then all of a sudden we start talking to somebody who may be here for three years and then gets transferred, or we have to go all the way to Hannibal, Missouri to make our case. So that to us as, as economic developers is a challenge. How do, how, and they don't always tell us what they're planning on doing. So that to me, community-wide, is something we ought to take a serious look at. The, the, you know, we have a very broad-based manufacturing base, and I'm very proud of it. Um, 20 years ago, when everybody in America said we no longer make things, we all said we got to make things. And we have an incredible breadth of, of um, companies in this community that is so diverse. Um, we like to say if you need to make it, you need to make it here. But Peter and I had a, a, a discussion over breakfast, really what's next in that area? If you think of the automobile industry, it's all about mobility. It's about driverless cars. It's about the technology that makes those cars driverless or the ability to be driverless. Where do we, as a region, play a role in that new part of that industry? Because we have a lot of terrific auto suppliers here. Are they ready? Are they thinking about that new, that new technology? And you, if you look at the, the Detroit 3, they all have offices in Silicon Valley. Is Google going to make a car, or are we going to keep the leadership in that industry in Michigan, which also impacts West Michigan? So those are some of the challenges. I'm not saying I have an answer, but I do know that we need to be thought leaders, and we need to look at it and be ready for it and not, get, and not play catch up. And part of that is the right, our work to make sure that we understand what is happening globally. Because I can tell you this. Even though the world population is oh, about seven or eight billion, by 2030, only about 110 million cars will be sold worldwide. 
which if you think about it, in a world with that many people, that's not a lot of cars. Because a lot of young people in this room would prefer to ride a bicycle to work, or a bus to work, or walk to work. The large, large um, metropolitan areas like Shanghai, Beijing, Tokyo, already hardly allow cars on certain days. You can't buy a car in Tokyo unless you have a parking place, and you can prove you have a parking place. In Beijing, they do day on, day off, uh, odd even driving days. So how do we deal with that when, when that industry is changing, just one industry? So we have to really be vigilant about that. I don't know if that answers your question, but those are the kind of things we are wrestling with. Yes. I, I, um, I yes, we have grown. In fact, we are one of the few areas in Michigan that has added population, which is actually a good thing because the state over the many years has actually been had a trending down. Um, I, I, I'm, I will be very candid with you. I don't know how – we have to can stay connected. That's the only thing that I, I know how to do. I, we need to continue to collaborate to keep this small town, big town feeling because I think that's what you're getting at is we, we have grown, and but how do we stay – you know, involved with each other. Is that what you're basically saying? Um, I don't have the answer. All I know is you, you don't want to lose that special connectivity um, amongst, amongst us. And that, I think, requires ex more work than when you're small and everybody is. But, but I, I'm looking at Megan. I'm going to pick on you. Um, Saul, who, um, who is a Grand Valley grad, double, and worked for us and now works for a private company. But she is totally engaged in, in connecting with her generation. And I think that's where this all needs to go next, is, is for the younger generation to start that connectivity. Tim? Sure. Um, the issue is about broadband, uh, connectivity, um, IT, and that really that whole industry. Because we talk a lot about infrastructure, and when we think about infrastructure, we think about hard infrastructure, right? Water, sewer, roads, um, airports, ports, etc. But but what has become a key driver of industry is really the c the ability to connect. I mean, when I moved here, I remember saying, I wish I had a television where I could see my mom when I talked to her on the phone, right? Forty years later, I can Skype with my niece, right? And it looks like she's sitting in the room next door. But that requires special, obviously, broadband capabilities. And that is, I think, where this area needs a lot of work. Uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur in Owego, that may not be so easy because you still have dial-up service. And that, to me, just isn't acceptable. So Right Place is leading a 13-county um, effort to analyze where, where are the holes in the broadband delivery system so that you don't lose phone calls somewhere between here and Kalamazoo, which shouldn't be acceptable when you sit on a high-speed bullet train between Tokyo and Nagoya and you can talk on your phone and never lose anything. So to me, this, this country, this region, and this community really needs to um, look very, very closely at our in all of our infrastructure, but broadband is a big one because everybody's going to cloud computing, everybody carries some kind of a device around where we're connected forever and ever all the time, right? Which is a good and a bad thing, but the fact of the matter is uh, people ought to be able to be an entrepreneur in whatever part of the state or region you're in and not just in big cities, so... It's a struggle nationwide. Um, so the question was the need for skilled trades in all kinds of trades. I see somebody from construction here. They're facing the same issue and talking to my colleagues literally from around the country and the world yesterday. That is not just our problem. Um, some years ago, and, and I know we're sitting in a four-year institution, but I also know that Tihas is somebody who really gets this. 
not everybody is going to go to a four-year ins uh, institution like Grand Valley. Um, some people aren't made for it. So, but what, what we did in this, in this country some years ago is really get out of the business of teaching people on the job, uh, what in Germany we call apprenticeships, uh, and which are now being rediscovered, and John Kennedy is uh, uh, the, the owner of Autocam is a leader in that area. And what we're facing are a few demographic, we're facing demographics, and we're facing disinterest in some of these skills, and I call them professions. Because whether you're a plumber or a professor at Grand Valley, you're a professional. I don't know about you, but I still need an electrician. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, so what, what we need to reinvest in is the idea that work is wor has worth. Whether you are a professor here or whether you are a welding graduate from another four-year institution who starts at $70,000 a year when he or she graduates. And we've lost that idea of skilled trades in construction, skilled trades in manufacturing. We still need tool and die makers. We need welders. We need carpenters. And a lot of the folks who are in those skilled trades right now are retiring in large numbers. 10,000 a day or something like that are retiring with a baby boom generation. So how do we engage young people around the idea that if you don't go to college, there are still skilled positions out there. There, are, there is work that has worth and that pays well, that pays living wages, and you can raise a family on it. So earlier this year, um, Michigan Works and the construction trades, the right place, the IT industry and the healthcare industry hosted 9,000 high school students at the boss place and had an interactive um, day, 9,000 high school students from 77 high schools, to, to show them the careers, careers that exist in these various industries. And we have to do more of that. Our biggest hurdle, quite frankly, I've said this many times, are parents. Every mom and dad wants their child to go to a wonderful institution like Grand Valley, and that's great. So what if that young person is not made for that? What if that young person goes to Grand GRCC and becomes um, a tool and die maker and goes to John Kennedy's shop and, and starts at 15 bucks an hour and learns for three years on the job, goes to school one day a week, and then becomes a certified whatever John does out there in the medical device industry. That, is, is, that has value too. And we need, and when Peter and I talked about robotics, we need robotics technicians. We need robotics professors, and then we need robotics technicians. It's not either or, it's this and. And so this country really needs to grapple and get its arms around the fact that how do, it's a continuum, right? And if you're correct, I keep picking on John Kennedy, but he does it right. He really gets it. So you get a young person, you teach them for three years, and if they then want to go to college, they still can. If they decide at 25, well, I really do want to be an engineer, here we go. But if they don't, they still have a really good job. And so that, that is that's something we deal with every day. Um, so we work with, our, with Kent ISD, we work with the community college, and then we work, obviously, with the, the universities and extension. So I think I'm getting the hook. Question. One more question. Yes. I've lost your thread here. You said that you were retiring from the high school students. Uh, I know one professor in Grand Valley County who was retiring from the high school students. Well, you're an ambassador. I may have a real ambassador here, but everybody in this room, as far as I'm concerned, is, p is part of the marketing of this community and what it is. When, when, when I talk about, I, I consider all of you an extension of us because we can't just do this alone. I mean, the right place is a handful of people telling the story, but every one of you has to tell that story. Every one of you has to convince one of your compatriots that there is room here for them, that there are opportunities here for them. Um, it's, just bef the night before Thanksgiving, Megan used to be one of our uh, hosts for that, Hello West Michigan and The Right Place host a homecoming of sorts at the Bob. We decided to do this a few years ago because um, 
The night before Thanksgiving is the biggest bar night in America because all the kids are coming home. Uh, more kids come, or more, I should say, more children or families come home for Thanksgiving than Christmas. And we thought we would capture them um, the night before and, uh, and show them what opportunities there are. We usually have about, what, 175 or something like that, 18 to 20 companies. And we have success story after success story of people saying, oh, Grand Rapids, it has changed. So, so be an ambassador. Tell one more person, tell five more people that really, that, that's up to you as much as us. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. I enjoy working with Birgit. Uh, we've known each other now for 10 years. I'm sure proud member of the right place. Yeah. And that notion of place comes through loud and clear. Uh, we heard names, uh, Peter and Joan and Sekia. Uh, we have Seedman. We have uh, DeVos, Van Andel, Cook, Hallenstein. You go on with the names. Uh, they had one thing that very much in common, and that was to be good stewards of the place. And I think that's uh, what our collective responsibility is. I think Bergen laid out a nice uh, uh, set of principles, those four. And I think the overlay then is uh, to uh, be good stewards of the place. Or as a good Coast Guard guy would say, leave it better than you found it. And I think that's what uh, these names, these people, these families have really done. They, they've been really good stewards of the place. Then we need enablers. And I think Birgit Close with her leadership, with the right place, is an enabler for us to come together and be good stewards of the place. And I do appreciate her, her leadership uh, uh, through these uh, last 10 years on, on creating that environment, as Rich DeVos would say time and again. We need to create that environment for all of us to succeed. And that enabler, is in people like, like Birgit. So let's give her another hand. Thank you. So from the Seidman College of Business, on behalf of our dean, uh, uh, we want to uh, put in your name uh, a hydrate aid uh, biosand filter system in your name for pure oh, water wow. for world in Honduras. Outreach hosted by Cascade Engineering. That's so fabulous. There Thank you. Go. That's great. I appreciate that. Oh, that fits me so well. Thank you. So enjoy the uh, rest of, the, of the, your day, and uh, we'll see you back here again for another breakfast. Thank you.